Thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me? Actually, okay. I'm getting thumbs up from the from the back rows at least. Rob, you can hear. Okay. All right. Groovy. Um, so, welcome to day three. I wasn't sure I'd actually get to today in some ways, but uh, here we are. So, um, you know, just to just to start out, you might be wondering why I keep wearing Albion stuff to the <laughs> to the the lectures in the afternoon, and that's really that's really because it's it's because of the college and the grants that this project exists, and so I'm kind of, you know, showing school spirit, wearing the company uniform, blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> um, so that's, that's really the reason for, for the attire. Uh, you know, just to kind of tag off of, of yesterday and last night, um, those, those 53 variations, they all stand as pretty wonderful pieces in and of themselves. Um, as I said, I've played many of them uh, in, during my church job over the last several years um, for voluntaries. And, uh, you know, but I think um, having, having had the chance for, for an audience to actually hear the work in, in its entirety, it's also interesting because while each individual variation has a great deal of musical strength on its own merit, uh, hopefully they were made even more valuable because of the fact that they participated together in, in this kind of sound world. And the only reason they're, of course, participating together is because that goes back to that common element, which is the waltz. And um, so I think that's a, a good jumping off point for today. Uh, and, and I'm going to kind of jump in and out of different lines of narrative, so to speak, to kind of talk through this, because a little bit of what I want to say is how this part happened. Um, none of this project came, came together entirely at, at one particular point. Um, you know, I, I started out on Monday by saying that I, I thought, I need, to, I need to find a new research track for myself and and so why not relearn the Beethoven Diabelli I mean that is that is a, a talk that I could give for several hours just on that piece and and then you you play it you know that's a that's a major major undertaking in in our world professionally and then as I said I I decided to layer on to that and this was maybe a few months later I decided why not actually start at looking at those Diabelli 50 plus? Um, and, you know, that <laughs> is, is its own major, major commitment, physically, mentally, musically. It's, it's a big deal um, just, just to work through that and, and to think about it, to analyze it, to, to talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, those two things alone could occupy someone for a very long time in their lives. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, this, this other element came to me gradually, uh, which was, it'd be kind of cool to see what's out there in the world. Uh, what's, what's possible, right? So, so you all have heard 88 different uh, compilations of the theme now, artistically. And, you know, I, I said after the Beethoven, is anything left to do? <laughs> and then after last night, I can pose the same question, is there anything left? And of course, what's happened is, is we've moved 202 years from when Diabelli sent out this, this 32 bars. And in 200 years, music has come a long way. Uh, and so, you know, um, I decided to, to just go for it. And with anything, you know, something like this, nobody's done this. There is another pianist that's now commissioning variations, um, but not playing the 50 and 
you know, mine's, mine's more of a large scale undertaking. But uh, with, any, with anything like this, you, you're not sure if it's gonna, gonna be fruitful or not particularly. Uh, and so the way that I began, I applied for some grant funding and I started local because it just seemed like, <laughs> what else do I do? You know, um, this, is, this was new. So I started local, which really meant that uh, I have a very dear friend who lives now in town named Ron DeSalvio. And um, my friend and, and colleague from the Gilmore Festival, Adam Shoemaker, uh, an alum, Dan Willenberg, another good friend, Karen Walwyn, and um, my husband has a very good friend, former student Carter Pan, who's not local, um, but, but those were my, that was my first net, so to speak. Would these people accept the commission? Would, would they wanna do this? You know, how's, how's this gonna go? And so at that point, that was, that was the scope of the project. And then, you know, you start to think a little bit more as it develops. And so I wait another year. And in the course of that year, I start to think, you know, this whole thing is, is, about, is about diversity and, and, and that fascinating intersection between unity and diversity, commonality and, and difference. And so, I can't achieve complete diversity. I don't have unlimited funds. But what I thought about was, okay, I got, I got some bites kind of locally. So what if I tried to find a composer from every continent? That became the next kind of, let's see what happens with this. And um, obviously Antarctica, I didn't really try for, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I thought, let's, let's just give it a shot. So, so there was a second wave of grant funding, and uh, I, I captured a, f a few more composers from, from different parts of the world. You know, some, some people said no, they were too busy, they, they just couldn't do it, and I think that's a really good thing for our field, that the composers were actually too busy to take on more money. <laughs> um, you know, so that, that's a positive. Um, so I, I cast the net then again, as I said, in, in 2018, and I captured a few more countries with the funding that I had available. Then in 2019, uh, which I'll kind of go into towards the end, um, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I had a website and if the website could be created and developed so that maybe it could go beyond commissions. Maybe it could, maybe it could go out into the world virtually and attract people that, that aren't going to get paid to submit, but maybe they just want to be a part of something and, and it might be a chance for them to get their names out, you know, to, to, to engage globally. Um, so 2019, I devoted most of my funding towards getting, getting that solidified, started. And then in 2020, uh, you know, the world just stopped. And, and so I had funding that was supposed to be directed, as, as I told many of you, um, for me to go perform the Beethoven in Costa Rica and for me to go to Oklahoma and all these places. And so I was able to redirect those funds to, to complete my continental uh, commissions. So um, I, I commissioned my composer from Asia and I also had a few, a few buddies, you know, and, that, and that's how this kind of all evolved. You know, we were talking afterwards, a few of us, about who knew about this in Vienna, who, who was talking about this, right? So it's kind of interesting because my friends would see what I was doing on Facebook and they'd say, you should really check out so-and-so. So a few of these composers are here because they're, they're acquaintances of friends and, and, you know, so it's become a new professional social world for me, um, you know? So, so I just wanted to kind of, kind of bring that up because it's, it's important how this all developed, really. Um, 
And so as we move into these pieces, then you're, you're going to get kind of a travel log of the world in some ways and, and uh, you know, just, just some interesting interactions with this music, I hope. Uh, to kind of give a, a foundational point of reference, in contemporary music, one of the biggest aspects of, one of the biggest components, I should say, of composition has been developments in rhythm and meter. Uh, so you're going to see the whole gamut of that in, in these works. Um, some, some composers treat rhythm and meter ametrically in some ways. Some of the composers really, really explore temporality in, in interesting philosophical aesthetic ways. Um, some of them have a folk influence. Some of them have, um, well, other types of folk uh, melodic things that, that guide the rhythm and meter, shall we say. Another big component of new music is texture. So, so how, how can the voices be related? How, how is music being explained? Is it straight melodies with accompaniments? I mean, the music that we heard last night, you know, that's the limitation of that particular period, right? You, we were, they were bound by kind of traditional melodic, harmonic, textural uh, capacities, shall we say? And so 200 years forward, those boundaries have been completely shifted. And, and that in and of itself is sort of a diverse perspective because we're looking at it from a, a rear view mirror in some ways in terms of perception of this waltz. Obviously harmony is, is another aspect that gets played with a lot. Um, and, and then I can also add that as a performer, this endeavor has stretched me in very new physical, sonic, technical ways that, that I'm not used to working in every single day. Um, the sounds that are required, I, I mean, last night's piece, the Beethoven, they are at the extremes of, of that particular style era in, in terms of how much is, is asked of the performer. But these works are in, a, in another zone in some ways. And, and so it's been refreshing, it's been difficult to, to adapt to those new techniques. And the other, the other thing that I have that's, that's wonderful about this is that no one else has this music. No, no one else in the world. Um, nobody has heard it particularly. I've played bits and pieces, um, but, but there's no tradition for these sounds. And so that's scary and that's amazing in, in both ways. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's kind of with that that, that I'll, I'll move forward now. And uh, so that's the story. And uh, the last bit of information that you need to know if you didn't catch on from the program is that I decided to take a page from Diabelli's book and, you know, what order am I going to play these in? <laughs> uh, it's totally up to me, right? Um, and so I decided to, to alphabetize by last name so I'm not making any values judgment whatsoever. And the, the really cool idea about that is that I could I could go somewhere to give a lecture recital on this music and I could change it around and create a completely different aesthetic experience because there are no rules for, for me. You know, it's funny, the composers would, I, I would say, are, are you willing to do this? And I remember I was sitting in a McDonald's on a WhatsApp call with my South African composer and, and she was saying, but, but what do you want? And I said, the sky's the limit. And it was almost like they wanted me to, to give them a boundary somehow, you know, because, because it, was, it was fun for them, but, but some of them, it was very unknown too. You know, here it is, here's this thing, please go play. 
you know. And um, so, so it's it's been it's been great. Uh, so my my first composer is Victor Agudelo, and Victor was born in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, he describes himself, he says, Victor's exotic and exuberant country surprises us and is heard through the inexhaustible universe of his music. It's risky, impactful, expressive, playful, dramatic, solid, and perfectly interweaves everyday life into itself to reach the peak of musical expression. It also uh, his bio talks about after a childhood amongst tiples, which is Colombian small guitars, bambucos and pasillos, which are Colombian popular music genres, and a youth marked by his first compositions, he went on then to, to get a degree from Colombia, and then he got his doctorate in the United States. Um, he, one other interesting aspect of Victor is uh, under Maestro Cameron Inse's baton, he incorporated to his musical aesthetics sonorities from other latitudes, Australia, Indonesia, Mongolia, Sardinia. It was during those days that he composed Continental Prism, a work that received the Morton Gould Young Composer Award. Um, he also composed um, a piece or two pieces, two compositions, where he approaches the difficult situation of the armed conflict and the social inequality of his country, Boyhaya Choco 2002 and Mazorka uh, 1000. He has since kind of returned to um, using Colombian folk music in his, in his compositions, and that's what you will hear a little bit today. Um, it's so creative that he called it Leah Belly. I literally never would have come up with that. So he wrote this piece on April 3rd and 4th, 2020, two days. These people are amazing, by the way. I just, I think they're um, amazing. So uh, in this piece, this is all my sense of the work, okay? It's really in two parts. <clears throat> He uses uh, what I would call this rhythmic vibrancy going on. It's quite percussive. It's very folk-like. Um, you hear uh, open fifths, kind of like, like string fiddle music going on. Um, it's a bustling toccata kind of piece. And I would describe its overall arc as being um, sort of moving to the center and then coming away. And what you'll hear is like the gestures go in one direction in one half and then they kind of switch directions in the other. Um, and it's very easy to hear what he has latched onto, but, but the greatest thing is this kind of percussive rhythmic drive that's in this piece. So here's just a little bit of what you'll hear tonight. A booger, but it's cool. Uh, so, so this is just just one of the ways that someone interpreted this waltz theme, and as if that wasn't enough, we have twelve other people to talk about. So, uh, moving forward, um, Dr. Kevin Beavers is someone that I got to know through Carter Pan. So I was looking for someone from Europe and none of these composers represents all of say South America or all of Europe, but it's, it's just a it's, a, it's a little glimpse into what could be possible, you know? Um, and so I, I met Kevin met Kevin virtually through Carter Pan. And so Kevin uh, lives in Dusseldorf. Yes, Dusseldorf, I had to remember. Um, so he has emerged as a rising star among the next generation of, of composers. Uh, 
So he, from 2003 to 2005, he was the fifth composer to participate in the California Symphony's highly esteemed Young American Composer in Residence program. Uh, his works have been performed by several major U.S. orchestras, including those in St. Louis and Philadelphia. He has received commissions from the Tanglewood Festival, Santa Barbara, the Detroit Civic Orchestra, the New York Youth Symphony, the University of Michigan Symphony Band, the Boston Conservatory, and the Brooklyn Friends of Chamber Music. Um, furthermore, he's taught composition and theory at the University of Texas at Austin and at Interlochen. Um, he received the Rudolf Nissim Prize from ASCAP, a commission grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Charles Ives Scholarship from the Academy of Arts and Letters, and um, he also won first prize in the Omaha Symphony's Composition Competition. Four ASCAP Morton Gould Awards, the list is long. He's, he's very uh, prolific and really amazing. Uh, so Kevin, submitted a piece called Diabelli Variation, and it is a study in um, condensation. It's very short, uh, but inside of it is a tremendous amount of material. And there's another composer around 250 years ago that also did this in some of his late works, and that's Beethoven. Some of his late sonatas experiment with great length, and some of them experiment with great compression. And so I feel like that's kind of borrowing from that lineage in a way. Uh, what, what Kevin does is he begins basically with a chord that has all the notes of the opening waltz in it. And you will hear repeated chords happening. You'll hear sequences happening, albeit in more of a modern um, take on the harmonies, and you'll hear a lot of huge dynamic contrasts and a great registral shift. I won't play the whole thing because you can hear it tonight, but just a little bit. is just, it's, it's like everything in this much space. <laughs> um, and and he, he does it just in such an amazing genius kind of way. I should also mention that there's no time signature in this, in this piece. So there are, there are rhythms, but it's organized kind of temporally. Uh, I have rests and I have note values, but, but it's, it's, not, it's not a regularized uh, time signature, so that's something interesting. Uh, Ron DeSalvio has, I've known him since basically I came to Albion. Uh, he now lives here in town. And Ron is, he was born in Brooklyn. Uh, he started his musical journey studying accordion. And, uh, but at age 16, after hearing Dave Brubeck play live at Carnegie Hall, he discovered his passion for jazz piano. He studied with legendary, the legendary Lenny Trista. Um, he played many, many jazz clubs in Greenwich Village in the late 60s. He's performed with Sonny Rollins, Joe Henderson, Enrico Rava, Renee McLean, Roland Kirk, and Art Farmer. He has taught at times at Hillsdale and Kalamazoo College. He's a member of ASCAP and several other organizations. He has an album entitled um, Essence of Green, which was a tribute to kind of blue. And I am um, I'm, I'm feel very fortunate that Ron was willing to be a part of this project. His piece uh, was composed, as he wrote, on June 9th, one day, uh, 2017, which is the Strawberry Full Moon. And I describe this as a very eclectic variation because what Ron does is he seamlessly puts together a series of variations inside a variation. And so each variation has its own character, its, its own texture, and, and he is so good at um, 
improvising that, that he moves seamlessly between these different ideas. Um, the first one starts out kind of in a hymn jazz style, and, and then we move to sort of a high register dolce singing style, and then we get into kind of some almost quasi-minimalistic gestures that are repeated, which of course borrows from one of the elements of the waltz anyway, which is repetition. So here's a little bit of Ron's. So it's it's just it's lush it's it's uh, it's a thick texture. I forgot to switch. Sorry. There's Ron. Sorry. Uh, it's a it's a thick texture. You know, at times, and then other times you get these really rhythmically vibrant passages, and it's just a lot of fun to play, fun to hear. Uh, my next composer in the alphabetical list is Yin Tang Lu, and Yin Tang uh, is someone that I have never personally met, although we've definitely corresponded. Um, but I, uh, I hadn't been able to um, meet any composers from Asia that were willing to take on the project. Like I'd had a few names and, and they were busy or whatnot. And so finally last summer, a composer friend of mine on Facebook said, why don't you try Dr. Chen Yi at UMKC? Dr. Chen Yi has won the Pulitzer, um, of course, and she's amazing. And I was like, Dan, are you serious? You know, <laughs> um, and and so I emailed I emailed her, and she was extremely gracious and was wanting to take the project, but she, of course, being as well known as she is, um, was was too busy to be able to take the commission. But she said, I have a very talented doctoral student, and what a talented doctoral student she has. Um, this has been uh, just kind of a, a remarkable, remarkable submission for me on, on just every level. Um, she composed it in about, I would say, four weeks. Uh, and so just a little bit about her. She's been a composer and teacher in the composition department of the Tianjin Conservatory of Music in China. Uh, she entered the composi composition department of the Central Conservatory in 2007. After that, in 2012, she went to Germany and studied with Walter Zimmermann at Berlin University of the Arts, where she got a Master of Arts. She's been, since 2018, getting her doctoral degree, as I said, from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where she has studied with Professor Chen Yi, among others. Her compositions have included chamber music, orchestral music, and others. Her chamber work in 2010, full of twists and turns, was premiered in Hong Kong, and it was commissioned by the Hong Kong Chinese Orchestra. Her duo of cellos, Flowing Water, and the chamber piece, The Inspiration of Spirits, was performed in Berlin. So she has begun to make a name for herself, obviously. Uh, and what she has done here is a real gem. So she has submitted, as you can see from your program, she has submitted five variations, including the theme, which I will play again uh, because it's in the score. Um, and I included this in the, in the program, but I'm, I'm going to read it nonetheless. In Beethoven's Diabelli Variations, Opus 120, Beethoven did not regard the melody of the original theme as the main component of the variations. Instead, he accomplished his great masterpiece by extracting the tiny materials of the theme, such as sequences, bass line, melody fragments, repeated notes, grace notes, fourth or fifth leaps, etc., and reworking these details to compose a series of distinctive variations that are both unified and independent. Inspired by the coexistence of unification and individuality in Beethoven's piece, 
I intended to reenact Diabelli's theme from the Oriental perspective. Therefore, I combined the above materials with Chinese folk melody or rhythm to create a kind of Chinese artistic conception on the basis of this musical theme of the Romantic period. In my mind, this variation is a bridge connecting not only the past and the present, but also Chinese and Western music. I didn't ask her to write that, but boy, does it really help my case here. <laughs> um, it's extremely profound in, in how she's thinking about this music. And so she's bridging the two cultures, she's bridging the, the two um, historical time periods, and um, the, the product is, is just a sheer tour de force, really, truly. Uh, I think I'll try to discuss each one individually. Um, and the first one is interesting. It, it does have a meter. All of her pieces have a meter. Um, and what she does is, is exactly what Beethoven does in variation one. You know, Beethoven undercuts the waltz with a march. She undercuts the three, four meter with a six, eight meter piece. And it's a very flowing, lyrical, you know, and, and when I got the music last summer, I was like, oh, this isn't going to be that hard to learn. <laughs> and then I turned a few pages. <laughs> um, but anyway, so here's a little bit of, of variation one. forth it's just it's just fantastic like she she has everything there and yet there's so much more to be said variation two is a slow variation marked serenely and the way I would sort of describe this it's in kind of an ABA form uh, it's in triple meter um, and I she uses the half step from the turn she uses fourths quite a bit um, and also the turn figure, just that, that whole idea of, of moving notes. Um, they're very much expanded and different than that, but, but the shapes are there. The shapes and the sounds are there. The texture is almost what I would categorize as kind of, in my experience, because I have not enough knowledge, but in my experience, kind of a cross between a slow Charles Ives and Toru Takamitsu and, and maybe some Impressionism all in, in one. Uh, there's, there's long, long gradated petals that, that smear these sound palettes. And, and at first I was scared to do that because you know my brain is just locked into clarity of petal all the time. And, and so this has caused me to have to rethink my relationship between literally my ear, my brain, and my foot. And what I've realized in, in the time since I started learning it is that those sounds are beautiful. Blurring, blurring that context creates a, a different sense. So what I'd like to do is play you a little bit of the opening the way she pedals it, and then I'll play it the way that I wanted to pedal it, and it's a very different experience. So, first is her pedaling. Just, you get this um, ringing dissonance between elements, and it's supposed to be there. If I play it the way that a classically trained pianist would play it,
it's, it's just not, not right, you know. These sounds are meant to be heard. Time is meant to be more dissolving than it is clear cut. And those, I think that seamlessness is sort of symbolic of what she's talking about in her preface somewhat. Um, the middle section is uh, very different. It has quite fast passage work. So completely contrasting B section that is expounded from that turn figure, really. It's just, it's just incredible. Variation three, it's a whole new world. <laughs> it's, it's Bartok meets percussion meets Prokofiev and folk music and fourths and changing meter and it's, it's fast, it's a, it's a Toccata-like um, and it's incredible. So here's a little bit. Super amazing, hard to play, fun to listen to, um, just genius. Variation four comes back, it's marked mysteriously, and uh, it is in 4-4 four, four meter, um, but that is, that is kind of ameliorated by a huge diversity of rhythmic values and pedalings and textures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is kind of a pseudo-impressionistic dream dreamscape, and, and I would almost call this kind of a quasi-nocturne in, in its style. So here's a little bit of the opening. It's just, it's just glorious. It really takes apart that whole grace note turn figure idea. The fourth is there. And yet, in this sound capacity, you, you know, we're so far away from that waltz. We're so far, but it's still there. And, and that's intriguing. The fifth variation is labeled scherzando. I would almost call this like a two to multi-voice invention almost. It's, uh, it's kind of through composed, although you hear ideas coming back. You hear the fourth. The rhythms uh, are fascinating. She focuses on the half step a lot and the fourth, as I said. Um, and it's, it's a real tour de force to finish this whole set. I mean about what people can do with rhythm 
<laughs> you know, it's a palette. It's a whole, uh, when I teach theory and we add a chord to their knowledge, I talk about getting a crayon box that has more colors. You know, that's really what this is like because the rhythm gives a composer the ability to, to just imagine anything. Anything is possible in terms of time. Uh, so moving on, Manuel Matarita has actually come here and performed. And um, I have to say, I've made a really good group of friends around the world. And it all started in 2015 when I traveled to Serbia, of all places, um, for a conference. And it was, it was maybe the best international conference that I've been to because we were in this little tiny town called Novi Sad. And there was just a group of us that kind of started having coffee in the, you know, in the uh, city squares in the afternoons. We'd go to sessions and then we'd meet up and, and we'd do the same thing at nights after concerts. And, and um, we, we all kind of were traveling in and out of Serbia at different times. So there'd be a bigger group of us, sometimes in a smaller group. And Manuel was, was one of the people that I met there. And he has graciously invited me. I've actually been to Costa Rica two times. As I said, I was supposed to go play the Beethoven last year um, as a national premiere. No one has performed the Diabelli variations in the country of Costa Rica. And I was supposed to get to do that. Um, so I consider Manuel a very, very dear friend. Um, he also is the person that introduced me to Victor. So I, you know, a, a, a world becomes enlarged because I have a good friend. And I, I will say that this group of friends that I met at this conference, we are all still pretty close with one another on Facebook and whatnot. And that's been uh, a great privilege, actually. Um, so Manuel is a fantastic pianist. As I said, he has come here and performed a few years back. Um, he has appeared around the world. He's been to Spain, Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, Peru, Brazil, Colombia, Cuba, and of course the United States. Um, he recently released a recording entitled Uma Milpa y Buenos Gaies, which includes piano music by several Costa Rican composers. Uh, I can say that this is probably a little bit outdated information because he's, he's also just an incredibly fast learner and he's released multiple CDs now of different Costa Rican composers and, and other South American composers as well. Um, he was a featured soloist and clinician, as I said, in Novi Sad. Um, he has gone to the University of Costa Rica, the University of New Orleans, and Louisiana State. He teaches at the University of Costa Rica in San Jose. Uh, so I was communicating with him, and he said, he just said, he said, I'll write you a variation. I said, are you serious? And he said, absolutely. And of course, I'm not going to turn him down, you know. And he's such a colorful person, and uh, I didn't know what he, he was going to come up with, you know. And uh, what he gave me is just, uh, just incredible. It's, it's a bossa nova. Uh, so he turned the waltz into a bossa nova. And uh, it's, <clears throat> it, this is not a world premiere per se, because I have played this, but I just love it. I love him. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to share just a little bit, because I don't want to give you everything before tonight. But here's a little bit of the bossa nova. want to dance, right? I mean, who knew that you could do that to Diabelli's waltz, right? Um, just, just classically amazing. Uh, my next composer is Carter Pan. Uh, Carter was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2016. I had to look at the date. Uh, so he teaches at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and my connection to Carter is um, that my husband taught him piano, 
and he's a monster pianist, and he writes a lot for the piano, as well as other things. Um, he has written for and worked alongside musicians from around the world, including performances by the London Symphony and the City of Birmingham Symphony, the Tchaikovsky Symphony in Moscow, radio symphonies around Europe, the Seattle Symphony, Symphony the National Repertory Orchestra, youth orchestras of New York and Chicago. He has worked with clarinetist Richard Stoltzman, the Antares Ensemble, the Capitol Saxophone Quartet, the West Coast Wind Quintet, I could go on and on and on about Carter. Uh, if you don't know his music, I, please listen to it. It's incredible. Um, and, and just as an aside, uh, he says he was, as, as I told you, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Music in 2016. In his spare time, he challenges his students over the chessboard. Um, for me, when I, when I communicated with Carter, and of course I never in a million years expected him to latch on to this project, and he is truly one of the kindest, nicest human beings that I've engaged with, and um, it just so happened that the day that he finished his draft, um, we, were, we were talking about trying to get his, his commission paid over email, and uh, and my dog had passed away. My 17-year-old dog had, had died, and I was not in a good place. And I, um, I had another person from the college that, that had to put the paperwork together to pay Carter. And I said, you know, so-and-so, can you, can you take care of this? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just not able to engage because my, my dog passed away, and it was like a member of my family. And Carter wrote me, the most beautiful, touching email, telling me that it, he was so sorry, and and you know it was it was just it was so not not something that he had to do, and yet he chose to engage. So you know he he seems to be just a real gem of a person. I've talked to him over the phone. I have not gotten to meet him in person yet, but um, a very special special guy. Uh, he wrote this piece, Variation on a Theme, by Anton Diabelli, and it's really in kind of a sonata form. Um, he has done amazing things with this piece. So the first thing that he does out of the gate is quote Chopin's first etude. Um, and so we know that we're in kind of a romantic style because of that. Um, he writes tremendously virtuosic passage work, and what happens is, is that for his second theme, he has a pretty famous quote from Beethoven, which I'll play for you. And the first time that he does it, he is in the key of A-flat major, and I'll elaborate on that in, in just a moment. Um, and then he has a development that's just astounding. And then we go back to our recapitulation of the music. And, and it is very difficult to play, but unbelievable in its craftsmanship and how he handles this. So let me give you a few reference points first. Um, the Chopin etude uh, literally sounds like this when it starts. And that's exactly what Carter does to begin. So it is just direct Chopin. Um, this is a pretty familiar sonata by Beethoven. It's called the Waldstein Sonata. Also in C major, kind of has a repeated note idea. You know, keep that in mind a little bit. Um, you'll hear, you'll hear Waldstein. Uh, the other thing I need to play for you, some of you might recognize this. That's our good friend Rachmaninoff, that's the G minor prelude. Um, so when Carter quotes Beethoven's Waldstein Sonata, he's of course making this direct allusion back to Beethoven, uh, but he does it in the key of A-flat major, which is a tremendously important key in the Waldstein. So it's, it's, it's not only the, the thematic reference to Beethoven, but it's also 
the harmonic reference to Beethoven, and, and so that's just captivating. Um, I'm not going to play everything, but, but you'll get a little taste. There's our first theme. And the second theme is this. So a little bit of Waldstein, you know, not quite, but a little bit. Uh, here's a little bit of the development. Rachmaninoff. <laughs> um, so he, he, he quilts this all together in just this stunning, stunning piece, and I am privileged to, to be able to play it. It's, it's just incredible. Next in my series of composers, variations, is Peggy Polias. And so Peggy is another Serbian connection. <laughs> um, so my friend Erica Booker, who teaches in Australia, I met her in Serbia. And so when I had money to commission a composer from Australia, Erica was, was my friend. And Peggy is someone that she knew, and hence the connection. Um, so Peggy lives in Sydney. And she prepares scores, instrumental parts, and other print music materials for some of Australia's leading composers. Uh, she studied with Anne Boyd at the Symphony, uh, Sydney Conservatory. Excuse me. Uh, she has had works performed and workshopped by Kammerklang, Kuring Guy Philharmonic Orchestra, Halcyon Chrono Chronology Arts, and at the Australian Youth Nas Orchestra National Music Camp and Canberra International Music Festival. Uh, in 2015, recordings of her works Electrofractal Gamelon 2011 and Fligishton were released on the digital album Beta. So she is making a name for herself. She's incredibly talented. And she wrote a piece called Fragmentation on a Theme by Diabelli. Peggy's main compositional interest is in fractals. Um, before I studied this piece, my knowledge of fractals was about the size of probably a fractal. <laughs> um, and so a fractal is a never-ending pattern, and that is, that is precisely how I could describe this piece. It, it works in two phases. Um, it is in 5-8 meter, and what she has literally done is taken every individual note of the theme and placed it in ethereal places. And so um, it's, it's this incredibly, uh, what do I want to say, pensive, reflective piece that moves in what I would describe as almost a Doppler effect, where, where the middle is this kind of culminating, arching point, you know, and, and, and then, it, then it moves away. It also works in, in this kind of binary way because the first half has two plus three rhythmic div divisions, and the second half has three plus two. The first half basically is in the higher register, the second half is in the lower register. So it's, it's symmetrically oppositional of itself, but it's, it's so pristine and so calming. Um, I've just fallen in love with what she's done. So just a little bit of the opening.
it's just just astounding. Who knew that that waltz could give us this, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to have her on board. Ryan Powell is a former student of mine and uh, very talented. Uh, Ryan, um, his biography states, I grew up in the college town of Ann Arbor, Michigan, a melting pot of great art and science. Um, he plays a bunch of different instruments. He came to us as kind of a transfer student and uh, just incredibly talented. And we are proud to say that he is at NYU finishing up a master's in their film school, which is a huge deal. Um, and <clears throat> I'm also proud to say that Ryan has done some pretty amazing, amazing things already. He has um, written songs and stories based on scientific research programs meant to educate and inspire through accessible and engaging means, which are then animated. One was made during an arts internship for NASA's Psyche mission. One is in production for the University of Tromso Arctic Whale Research and another for the University of Mich Michigan CubeSat technology. So Ryan is already finding a place in the compositional world as well. And the fun story about Ryan is that I was talking about this project at a, at a house concert a few years back and one of my students came and he was the president of the band honorary fraternity and, and his also, name was also Ryan and he came to me and he said, I really, I really wanna give you a variation. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah. So the band fraternity commissioned Ryan Powell on, on my behalf. And it's, uh, it's a privilege to play his piece. So Ryan is, uh, has contributed a compressed variation as well. Um, it's, it's in binary form. And he really explores the repeated note aspect, the grace notes. I mean, it's, it's very audible what he's working with. And I won't play everything, but here's a little bit. Just incredible, it's fascinating um, and, and brilliant. I think Ryan's gonna do great things. Uh, my next composer is Adam Shoemaker and he is a colleague at the Gilmore Festival. He directs the education department there uh, and the education department at the Gilmore Festival serves thousands of students in the Kalamazoo and surrounding areas. So it's not just that amazing two week festival that goes on every two years. It has so many more aspects to it. Um, Adam has received honorable mention in the American Prize competition for his song cycle, The Best Thing Ever, for soprano and Piero Lunaire sextet, uh, which was premiered by What Is Noise in March of 2016. His most recent commissions and grants have come from the Kalamazoo Artistic Development Initiative of the Arts Council of Greater Kalamazoo, Albion College, Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, and an upcoming work in 2018, so this is a few years ago, some assembly required. So Adam wrote a piece called Diabelli Diabelli, the squared idea. <laughs> um, and, and in this, uh, he explores cross rhythms and changing meters and the opening texture is, are all of the notes of, of the first few notes of the theme. Um, it's, it's very powerful, it's a big variation, it's kind of in a quasi sonata form and he, he alludes and parodies Schubert and Bartok and um, it's, it's fun, it's a little bit um, minimalistic, you know, a little bit John Adams at times and a little bit Philip Glass and it's just, it's a real privilege to, to play Adams' work. So here's a little bit of it. Thank you. 
just very powerful, very dramatic, a lot of, a lot of ebbs and flows in terms of, of dynamic structure and, and all of that. So it's a great piece. Just, I, I'm just amazed at what these people have done for me. Um, my next composer is someone that I'm proud to call a, a friend, and we met doing a Florence Price Music Symposium down in, in Arkansas in 2014, I think it was. Uh, and, and we stayed in touch, Karen and I. Uh, this is Dr. Karen Walwyn. And uh, when the opportunity presented itself for me to commission a composer, Karen was one of my, my first five because she's an astounding pianist and she is just a truly gifted composer. And, and that rare combination of a concert pianist and a composer, which kind of calls back on the days of the Rachmaninoffs and the Lists and whatnot. And, and she is just a compelling, compelling thinker. Um, Karen Walwyn teaches at Howard University in Washington, DC. She is a native of Queens, New York. Uh, one of the ways that you might be able to hear her maybe play, and one of the things that's so remarkable is she is the only person, I think, at this point, um, to have recorded the Florence Price Piano Concerto, which had to be finished because some of the manuscripts parts were, were missing. So the Center for Black Music Research in Chicago asked Karen to be the pianist for that legendary recording, and it's, it's incredible. Um, she is known for uh, not only her recordings of two volumes of music by American composers entitled Dark Fires, uh, she performed select works from her CDs at her New York debut. She also reprised that performance for on-air recordings with National Public Radio and WFMT in Chicago. She made a compositional debut at the Kennedy Center. She received a tremendous standing ovation of her work for solo piano entitled Reflections on 9-11. Uh, Robert Schulzleper of Fanfare Magazine evoked thoughtful emotion when he reflected on Ms. Walwyn's performance, imaginatively conceived and executed. It both disturbingly transposes the catastrophe into appropriately cataclysmic sound and artistically suggests the aftermath's lingering sense of numbing devastation. Dr. Walwyn was awarded a Mellon Faculty Fellowship for the 2011-12 academic year from the John Hope Franklin Institute at Duke University, where she completed her debut work, Choral Solo Piano African Percussion, entitled Of Dance and Struggle, a musical tribute to the life of Nelson Mandela. She has concertized all over the world, including Johannesburg, Barcelona, Tenerife in the Canary Islands, Salzburg, London, and locally. Um, I'm just thrilled to call her a, a very good professional friend, a very good friend. And uh, what she's done in her piece is uh, just a, a tour de force toccata-like concept. Uh, she takes the 3-4 meter and nearly every beat in the work has 16th note sex sextuplets. Um, it's very virtuosic. She really expounds on the notion of the half step. And then she also works temporally, I think, with some very key moments of notes, important notes from the theme. And it's, it's brilliant, it's difficult, and it's fantastic. So here's just a little bit. It's, it's, it's going to run me around quite a bit, and, and it's just remarkable. 
I, I don't have enough adjectives in my vocabulary for some of the things these people have done. Um, I am just happier than happy to have gotten to know Philip Wharton. Um, my husband knew him from Juilliard, but the connection for me to commission Philip happened just as a nonchalant a uh, friend of mine on Facebook said, hey, have you commissioned Philip? And I said, no. And she said, he's my buddy from Juilliard. And she said, you really, you really need to have Philip write you a variation. And thus, Philip has written me a variation. And it's incredible. So uh, Philip has a little bit of a, a bio on his website. Few artists enjoy such high praise for both of their disciplines as composer violinist Philip Wharton. Of his playing, the New York Times proclaimed a rousing performance, and the Waterloo Courier wrote a golden tone with breathtaking executions. His compositions, heralded from coast to coast, are described by the New York Concert Review as decidedly contemporary, both engaging and acceptable. He has written uh, for the Santa Fe Opera's um, Apprentice Scenes program. The Grammy-nominated Borealis Wind Quintet performed his quintet on their concert tours. His chamber symphony passing season performed by regional orchestras. And he also had a premiere of a symphony, which was a tribute to Shakespeare's 450th birthday. Um, and he also has a song cycle entitled Fools and concerts with Grammy-nominated soprano Caroline Wara. He's got a bunch of other commission projects. He lives in New York City. He and I have become really fun buddies on Facebook. Uh, I can't wait to go to New York City and, and meet him sometime. Um, and what he's done with this variation is just magical. Philip has, has really created a sonata form um, that has kind of everything but the kitchen sink in it. So he elaborates on the grace note motive, the half step. He includes a fugue in the development. And then a la Beethoven in his 110 sonata, where Beethoven writes a fugue and then inverts the fugue for the second half, Philip does that. So he writes a fugue, he elaborates on it, and then he inverts the fugue subject to the left hand and does all sorts of tremendous things. His dynamic range is, is incredible. Um, his, his imagination is, is just off the charts for, for how he has handled this composition. So here's just a little bit. It's just exciting, original, thrilling, and, and amazing. I am really proud to uh, have Dan Willenberg on this project. Dan was one of my think local, act global. <laughs> so one of, my, one of my first commissions. Dan was uh, my theory student, sometimes my piano student, my piano lit student. He was David's piano student. He graduated in 2011. He came to Albion and worked really hard to become an incredible classical and jazz pianist. He was a religious studies minor. He received his BA in K-12 music education um, from Albion. Then he went on after graduation to Western Michigan University where he got a master's in jazz piano performance. And then he was the first pianist at Western to be invited to do an artist diploma in jazz performance. He worked very hard and played a lot of gigs in Kalamazoo. And uh, he is now in New York City teaching uh, K through 12, I believe. And uh, he 
he started a variation the summer that I commissioned him, and then he said, nope, it's not right. And he stopped. And he said, I got to redo it. And I got this great fragment. I was like, why are you stopping? And, and he said, nope, it's, it's not right. And he got really nervous. He said, I don't want to compose for my theory teacher. I said, stop. <laughs> um, and, and if you know Dan, he's, he's just a, an incredible person. Uh, I'd say kid, but I guess we're all getting older now. So um, anyway, what he has given me is, is almost what I would call a, a jazz trio, in a sense and you have these layers of sound. And it's, it's very solemn, very somber, and brilliant. So here's a little bit of dance. proud moment. Um, last but not least is Dr. Jean Zydel Rudolph and she hails from South Africa. Specifically she was born in Pretoria and I love this, I love her tremendous um, musical upbringing. She was a young virtuoso pianist who studied with Goldie Zydel, Philip Levy, Adolf Hollis and later with John Lill at the Royal College of Music in London. Um, she got both her bachelor's and master's there. Uh, under Professor Stephens Grove, she became the first woman in South Africa to obtain a doctorate in music composition in 1979. She, she received an honorary doctorate in education in 2008. In 1974, she studied composition under the legendary composer Jorgi Ligeti in Hamburg, Germany. On her return to South Africa in 1975, she was appointed as lecturer at the Witt School of Music, held the position of professor of theory and composition from 2001 till her retirement in 2014. She has been frequently invited to be a guest composer and lecturer at festivals in Europe and the United States, uh, specializing in presentations on women's music as well as indigenous African music and its influence on intercultural music by South African composers. Uh, she has made a tremendous composition additionally to Jewish music in Johannesburg as pianist, musical director, composer, and arranger for the hugely successful show Celebration, which was premiered in Johannesburg in 1994. Subsequently, since 2000, Celebration has been performed to great acclaim in the U.S., Canada, London, and Australia. Uh, I got to meet her because a friend of mine actually who works at the Gilmore Festival is from South Africa. And when I was looking for composers to contact from, from the continent of Africa, Sophie sent me Jean's name. And um, she just looked so impressive. Again, I was like, I don't know if she'll agree to take on this project, you know. And uh, so the time frame, you know, between here and South Africa, I forget what the difference is, but she wanted to chat live, and so we got on WhatsApp, and I was in a McDonald's because I was having to take my son in the summer to, to some, I don't know if it was soccer or golf or whatever we were doing, and so we stopped at McDonald's and, uh, so that he'd be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I had a chat with her down down in Pretoria, and so she was saying, "Well, how long should it be? How how what what do you want from it?" And I said, "Well, I don't want anything. I just I just want what you feel you you feel inspired to give." And um, we had this really great exchange, just very casual and very loving. And uh, so what she has produced, she calls it. 
the Afro belly because in, in her words, she has uh, kind of pivoted a, a central portion of this variation on African drumming rhythms. And um, some of those are in like 13, eight meter, which are divided um, like, like three plus three plus two plus three, and then there's 12, eight, which is three, two plus three plus two plus two plus three, and, and these incredibly fun little patterns that, that get all these unique asymmetrical accents within a measure, and it creates just this, this incredible um, visceral rhythmic feeling. And um, so there's, there's very percussive aspects to her compositional style. But then there's also kind of a rhapsodic element as well. And the piece is really in a kind of an ABA form. And the outer sections have these triplets. And, and she really exposes the fourth and the half step in, in truly unique ways. So we go back to triplets, right? That seemed to be the story of some of last night's variations. And now we're, we're back to triplets. So here's a little bit of the Afro belly. to play, a little hard to count, but for me, I'm not a percussionist, um, but amazing. And uh, the other thing I should say is right where I stopped. So we have a D, uh, A, B, E. So D, A, B, E, those literal notes are in there and she spells out the name Diabelli using those notes in the score. So it's, it's very cool how she incorporates that little cipher into the music a la Robert Schumann, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really just, just an amazing submission, I think. Um, I have one more slide, and, uh, which is this. And now I have to. So this is my website, and this is where I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave you all. Um, I was supposed to get to have a little like website premiere last March, but then COVID hit. And so the website has been in various stages of production because believe it or not, between my practicing this music and teaching my son virtually, it seems like every other day and, and you know, exercising and, um, whatever else I do. Uh, I, don't, I don't always get back to the website maybe as much as I would like, but I hope in this next phase of my kind of life where I can kind of relax on, on practicing these pieces quite so much is, is to revisit this. And so this is here, and um, I'm not gonna read things to you, but uh, I'm very proud of it, and hopefully people around the world someday now, whenever, we'll, we'll begin to find it. And, and that's my next little funding project this summer to kind of add some things to this um, and to, you know, to kind of get it out into the world a little better than I have. But here it is, and, and the hope is, at least I think this is my hope, um, that, you know, just in the few bars you heard from all 13, it's just like a whole canvas or mural of new potentiality from this theme has erupted. And um, this, this website, you know, what I would love is that this project just keeps spinning itself out for life. And that I don't have money, you know, to, to continue endlessly paying for commissions. But um, like I said at the beginning, if new composers find it, and, and they find me, it's, it's a chance for them to, to find, 
to find a way to produce music and to become known on some level. And, um, you know, and the creation of, of new art, new music in this case, is, I think, very valuable still. Uh, if you remember the early videos on the news from the pandemic, Italy got hit really, really hard, right? And uh, one of the you know, one of the positive things to come out of that was there was a, I don't know if it was a tenor now, I can't remember, on the news that got out and sang an aria on his balcony because people had been so disconnected, but yet they were so connected. You know, the, the, the world shut down, but there was a capacity for connection in new ways. And, you know, for me, I got to connect with my son more because I wasn't traveling, I was home. You know, now some days that was rough. <laughs> Other days it was glorious. And, you know, um, so people had to really slow down in a sense to, for the first time. And so, you know, art, played a role in that, as it always does. Like we heard about Karen Walwyn in 9-11 in and things like that. Art is always there. Music is always there. And so I feel like in perpetuity that this project has, you know, hopefully a, a resilience in, in continuing to find new individual diversities, you know, whatever, whatever those are. Um, in terms of who's submitting, where they're submitting from. I mean, I have these, you know, lofty goals of maybe having a map someday and having pinpoints on the map of every person that's contributed a variation. And, you know, if one new person contributed a variation, the work that you will hear tonight becomes an incredibly different, valuable piece of, piece of art, piece of music. And... Um, so if I can leave you with anything, um, the, the new CD that's coming out with all of these has, as I said, extensive <laughs> liner notes in them, but also has the composer's websites. And so, um, you know, I know this is a small audience, obviously, but, you know, go, go listen to music by, by these people because they, they are just astounding and um, I hope if I leave with this thought because I don't get to come back tomorrow and talk <laughs> maybe that's a good thing but um, you know each piece is a miracle and it is completely compelling as an individual magical creation but to be heard in this unified work I think only elevates each one of them in a greater way than they could be elevated just on their own. At least that's my hope. And, you know, it's just, as I said to close, it's, it's completely astounding to me that, that Walt generated the sounds that you will hear tonight. Uh, because my mind as limited as it is, would, would never go to those places, those fantastic spaces that are being explored with this. And, and it's been just a fantastic journey. So I really appreciate you all listening to this. I hope it was helpful for what you'll hear this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you.